How much of the history of women's basketball do you know? Elizabeth Galloway McQuitter from Legends of the Ball, Inc. spoke about the intersection of AIAW, Title IX, and WBL Trailblazers and the importance of knowing the history of the game. Ogumba Wallet for the win! You are Locked On Women's Basketball. Your daily podcast on women's basketball. Hello and happy Thursday. You are locked on to women's basketball. I'm Natalie Heffern and I'm a features writer in the Atlantic 10 Beat Reporter for the next. Thanks for making Locked On Women's Basketball your first listen every day. And remember, Locked On Women's Basketball is free and available on all platforms, including YouTube. I've had the pleasure to write several stories about WBL Trailblazers and was live in Dallas to hear Elizabeth Galloway quitter. She talked about why Legends of the Ball Inc. was founded, introduced her board and their stories, and talked about both the history of women's basketball and why it's important for coaches and their teams to learn the history and the names of the Title IX AIAW and WBL Trailblazers. It was really incredible to hear Gallimay Quitter speak to three different groups of people, and while each speech was a little bit different, the moving message remained the same. Uh, Really excited for you to take a listen, so here it is called Legends of the Ball, Inc. And we promote the historic and social relevance of the WBL, which was the first women's professional basketball league in the United States. We actually promote Title IX, AIAW, and the WBL, because the the name of this session is Multiple Trailblazers, because we represent each one of those entities, okay? When you think of those entities, when you hear about Title IX, what do you think of? Anybody, what do you think of? Pardon me? Equality. 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 Hey, we got a long ways to go for that, don't we? (laughs) Equality. We think opportunity. But do you think of it as an entity or do you think of it with names and faces and seminal moments that occurred? Does anybody think of it in that light? Really, because you don't know the names and faces and seminal moments that occurred. And that's what this session is about. To connect the dots. Title IX just turned 50 last year and we're still celebrating it all the way through this year, organizations are, including us, but we don't connect it, we don't relay it, relate it to those women who step through the doors that Title IX opened. Somebody had to be first, right? Okay, so we have Title IX, and I listen to broadcasters and they go, oh, Title IX, oh, thank God for Title IX, we're celebrating 50 years of Title IX, but you can't name one person or one event or one anything that occurred because of Title IX. I think after I introduce my board, I think you'll understand what I'm saying, okay? These are members of our board. Let me give you a little history. I'm gonna jump, I'm gonna change course and go from the end first. In 2018, the WBL was inducted into the Women's Basketball Hall of Fame as Trailblazers of the Game, as the first Women's Professional Basketball League. A hundred of us showed up, and we had probably over 400 that played in the league over those three years. Proud, happy, excited, and we get on stage and they, and you know, and nothing against the Hall of Fame, they're a great partner, we're great partners with them right now, but the, the person who was announcing, and we got up there and they rushed us off stage. And we went up there and we were like, finally. And then we were rushed off stage, you know, like chattel, and we're like, wait a minute. We're more than the three years that we played. We're so much more than three years. We are not a league that failed. We are a league that propelled the game forward. We never left the game. Our handprints are all over the game. I know you. Our handprints are all over the game. (laughs) Yep. And so that's how Legends of the Ball Inc. started. My board, Rita Swindell. She's going to hook them horns for you. The horns? Okay. (laughs) First African American player at the University of Texas. Jody Conrad's first All American. Still holds records for points and rebounds. Has the distinction of coaching Teresa Weatherspoon. and played for the Chicago Hustle and the Dallas Diamonds of the WBL. This is such a brief synopsis, wait a minute, Rita. Such a brief synopsis of these women. It's just a brief overview, but there's so much depth and, and so much history to them. Okay, thank you, Rita. Adrian Mitchell Newell, University of Kansas. Second, still the second all-time, oops, still the second all-time leading scorer and rebounder behind Lynette Woodard, but Adrian came first and Lynette Okay, at 5'9", 
You know, today we talk about positionless basketball. Adrian was playing that back then. You could post up, play wing, play all those positions. You don't get to score over 2,000. You don't get to score that and rebound like that if you can't play those positions. Uh, played for the Chicago Hustle, where we played together, and then played for the St. Louis Street, all pro, all star in the WBL. Adrian Mitchell Newell. <laughs> Deborah Thomas. DK by way of Panola Junior College, their first All American. And you understand I'm saying first, first, first. We're not, we're not the first to play the game, of course. We've been playing it since 1892. But after Title IX, we are the first in that era, okay? That's why we're a generation of first once the game changed, okay? And DK left Panola, went to uh, Stephen F. Austin University, went on to play uh, for the Iowa Cornets. She's also an All American. DK Thomas. <laughs> We have our lone HBCU representative representing Albany State in Albany, Georgia, Charlene McCurry Jackson. Charlene had played, uh, let's see, she started off with the Milwaukee Doe's and then they folded, then she went to the Chicago. No, Washington Metro's, then the Milwaukee Doe's, then Chicago House and St. Louis Street. Char is, uh, was the MVP in the second women's basketball all star game. All pro, all star. Charlene McCorder Jackson. <laughs> Patricia Roberts. Okay, you might hear this name again. We're hoping pretty soon if the Naismith does what they're supposed to do. Trish is Pat Summit's first African American. She's her first All American. She led her to her first Final Four. She played on the first women's Olympic team in 1976. And they are up for induction into the Naismith. So we're hoping that that team gets inducted into the Naismith. They're, they're finalists. Trish played for, she's also the first African American coach at the University of Maine, first African American coach at the University of Michigan, and the first at Stony Brook, and in the ABL, coach for the Atlanta Glory. I'm making my point here when I say we were more than the three years we played. This is why we started. We were like, you don't bring us on stage and rush us off. We are not a league that failed. We never left the game. So, Patricia Roberts. <laughs> Machine Gun Molly Bolin. Molly has a book out, and you can Google that book and find out about the story. And when I say she's from Iowa, that should be enough right there. You know those girls from Iowa can shoot, because they, they only had three dribbles at the time, you know? Mm -hmm. So before, oh, two? Ooh. Before there was Caitlin Clark, there was Molly Bolin. Okay, fired it up, lighting it up. Molly went to Grandview College, and I went to Temple Junior College. And at that time, junior colleges were playing and beating four-year colleges. We beat all the in-state colleges, because after 1972, it took about three years, Senator Birch By, there's a name for you, women can't do anything without men and vice versa. We need all the groups to, well, I shouldn't say can't do anything. We can have a baby and that stuff, but can't do, we have to have the group that has the control on our side. And in 1972, Senator Birch By gave these universities three years to get things rolling athletically. So Molly in the state of Iowa, was a prolific scorer, played for the Iowa Cornets, and holds the record for most points scored in a women's professional basketball game, 55, and season average at 32, Molly Bowling. <laughs> I played at Temple Junior College right up the road, and then I played at UNLV, where my class was the first women to receive scholarships right after Title IX. We were that first class in 1975 to receive scholarships. Today's episode is brought to you by Ultimate Pro Basketball GM. Ultimate Pro Basketball GM is the coolest game I've played in a long time. I've always thought I could be a great NBA GM, and as it turns out, it's not all that easy. If you've had the same thought and have fantasized about managing your own basketball franchise, go and download Ultimate Pro Basketball GM right now. This game allows you to manage every strategic aspect of a franchise, playing through seasons, and leading your franchise and fans to glory as you build a historic dynasty. In the simulation, you're responsible for dealing with challenging personalities, both players and coaches, hiring the right coaches and assistants, trading and training players, and making draft picks. You also navigate your franchise through free agency and the draft and all the ups and downs of multiple seasons. All this in a challenging and realistic game world. Ultimate Pro Basketball GM is completely free and playable offline. Play on the go as you want and when you want to. I have loved getting to put my GMing skills to the test against my friends. Uh, it's been really great to be competitive with them. Uh, and I think everyone else is going to have the same experience uh, if you do that with your friends as well. Locked on Women's Basketball listeners get a 
100% free boost to their franchise when using the promo Locked On in the game store. So make sure to check it out. To download the game, just visit probasketballgm.com, scan the code, or look it up in the app stores. That's probasketballgm.com, Ultimate Basketball GM. Start your dynasty today. When I was saying, even though Title IX was 72, we all know it was not about sports, right? It was not about athletics, it was about education. We're proud to say we're all college graduates and that we were all pursuing excellence and in that process did something great. Did we know what it meant in 1972? Of course not. We didn't even know what Title IX was. I mean, we got some small town people, city girls, country girls, it didn't matter. It took us a while to understand what Title IX was, what it would mean to us, and what we would mean to it. And that's the journey we want to take from our quick. So, anybody heard of the AIAW? The Association for Intercollegiate Athletics for Women was the precursor to the NCAA. Because after Title IX, women played, they had AAU championships and invitational championships. And so they got together and formed the AIAW so that women could play under that, just like the, the men were playing. The men didn't want the women in the NCAA. Okay, so after the AIAW formed, they lasted for 10 years and they formed, their, they had their own championships. So they were the governing body for women's sports. And we all played under the AIAW up until 1982. And then that leads us to the WBL, the first women's professional basketball league in the United States. So it stands to reason, doesn't it, that as the game is growing, that you're gonna go from that level to the next level? And on display in that first game, women's professional basketball game, we all played with the men's ball, the 29.5. This is an original WBL ball. It's the current ball that you play with. It may look a little smaller, but it's, it was uh, designed, the idea was given by a woman named Karen Logan. In the 70s, there was a lot going on there. We're calling it the Battle of the Sets, as you guys if you don't, you, you're too young to remember, but you heard when Billie Jean beat Bobby Riggs in the tennis. You guys heard that? Yes? No? Okay, well, and Annie Myers was participating in the Battle of the Sexes. This woman, Karen Logan, who was a member of the world famous Redheads, like the traveling team, like the Harlem Globetrotters, and they all dyed their hair red. And she said, she came up with this idea for the ball, because she beat him with the men's ball in the game, of course. But she said, if golf alters their equipment, and bowling alters their equipment, and tennis alters their equipment. Doesn't it stand the reason that women should, the basketball should be altered for the smaller hands, for that would improve the game? Her vision was, if this ball was smaller, ball handling would improve. Boy, did it ever. Passing would improve. I was telling earlier, I remember catching this ball and being able to just throw it full court where I couldn't control that big one, okay? Uh, did not improve shooting, but it gave us range. Because if you couldn't shoot with the 29.5, you went miraculous to shoot with this one. But, <laughs> but Caitlin, Taras, all of them that have that deep range, it's because of the ball. You know, that doesn't mean they couldn't shoot with that other ball, but it, it, that's where it changed. Now, do you think it revolutionized the game that we play today? You betcha, because we watched that growth. But the colleges didn't adopt it until 1982. A lot of the top coaches of the time, even Pat Summit, they did not want the ball because they thought people would think it was not a real game, it would damage our game, but it didn't. It changed our game for the better. And I think that's the skill set and that's what you see today. Okay. The African American women in the WBL had a huge impact and we, we look at these faces and when we talk to groups, we're like, we have the same faces, we have the same goals, we have the same dreams. And they had a major impact on the WBL and every league that followed. Okay. Excuse me if I go fast, but I, 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 I do talk a lot and I'm trying to be cognizant of time. I want to talk to you, I want you to leave here connecting some of the dots. And I want you to leave here with something you can go and pass on to your players. This is us. This league never launched, but we always mention them because you have to acknowledge people for trying. Everybody chipped away, and chipped away, and chipped away, and tried. And we don't say we're the league that failed. We say we're the league that propelled the game forward. 
the LPBA, which Molly and Adrian played in the WBL, the LPBA, and then WABA, Molly played in, and we have a WABA representative, Essie Washington played with, played with WABA, and her daughter plays at Texas A&M. So uh, we're continuing to have an impact on the game. NWBA, LBA, where they have the tights on, you know, just still trying though. And people called it sexist, but we're trying, right? We're trying to show that this product is a good product, a sustainable product, all the way up to the WBA, which was really played the schedule of the current WNBA in the summer. I'm sure most of you have heard of the ABL, and finally, the WNBA. So when you're talking and talking about history, nothing just happens. Somebody comes before you. Somebody has a story. All of our stories are the same, with the same theme. Our paths may be different, our universities were different, how we got there was different, but we have a story to tell. And as Maya Angelou said, there is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside you. So please go back and find your trailblazers at your universities. You'll find them in the record books. And whose responsibility is it to tell this history? We're taking on that responsibility on our own. But it is also your responsibility as coaches. It's the media. It's the places that house history. It's the broadcasters. We listen to broadcasters all the time and we go nuts. And they'll talk about things, but they won't have, they don't have the, you don't know what you don't know. So, but they don't have the information to just parlay right into a story about somebody of our era. Last session, we had Charlotte Smith in here. Anybody heard of Charlotte Smith? I know you did. Anybody else? Charlotte Smith played at the University of North Carolina, hit the winning shot in, what was it? What year did she say it was? 90 something? Yeah, okay. I think she dumped too. Yeah, okay. So what that phenomenon is called, is called the new forgotten. Because we, as women coaches, as female athletes, we don't connect the dots the way the men do. Go to an all-star game, and the late great Bill Russell and Dr. J and Mike, they're all sitting there, right, on their phone. This is just in the W, I mean, in the NBA. And they are revered and they're honored, and they connect their past over their 75 years. Okay, and I'm not just speaking pro. Now, the NBA, everybody thinks pro, pro basketball started with the WNBA that we don't get invited, we're not honored, we're not there. And what Charlotte said was, I just want to thank you because I grew up being a little girl wanting to aspire to play and to look, and I had no one to look to. And David Thompson, I don't know if you know that name, was a great player at NC State. Uh, he was her cousin? Uncle. 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 So she looked up to him. And so what we want to say is we were there, we never left, and we're still here. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. The tournament is heating up, and there's no better place to get in on the action than FanDuel, America's number one sports book. That's because right now, FanDuel is giving new customers a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's up to $1,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. Just go to FanDuel.com slash locked on and sign up to claim your no-sweat first bet. Then you can wager on everything from the money line to point spreads to which team will be cutting down the net all on an app that's safe, secure, and super easy to use. So don't miss your shot at a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000 when you join FanDuel today. Just go to fanduel.com slash locked on to sign up. Make every moment more with FanDuel. Which brings me to this. I coached, yeah, 1,000 plus, and we really have continued counting and, and getting in touch with our uh, WBL teammates and uh, Natalie here, who's filming, they are, it's the next, they are writing WBL stories. So if you don't know who the next is, they write, they cover every conference. They probably covered your games, every conference. They cover, cover the WNBA, they cover Athletes Unlimited, and they are writing about our stories, and we're trying to get them to tell their stories. And so in listening to their stories, we're finding out more and more, oh, you coach too? Of all the Title IX Benefits. We all graduated. We took that Title IX education and we went everywhere. One of our greatest impacts was coaching. On our board alone, we have 155 years of coaching. Hey, I coached for 32 years, 20 at the Division I level, 12 in high school. And we have coached at every level. One of our members, Peggy Gillum Granderson uh, from Ole Miss, is not here today. She still holds the record for points and rebounds at Ole Miss, by the way. And if you go to Mississippi and don't know who the Gillum sisters are, her sister Jennifer played in the WNBA. 
okay? So that's one of the things that we feel our story needs to be told so that you can connect the dots to that as well. From the WNBA to beyond, I, I haven't gotten to that one, but it wasn't just in the field of sports or coaching and broadcasting and every, every, every ugh, area you can imagine, there's been a WNBL player, there's been a trailblazer that has impacted the game. What would, do we want you to do from here? We want you to pass it on and pay it forward, which is our mantra. The women have got to start connecting the dots, cementing every era on a timeline, putting names and faces and moments. I don't always say pattern everything after the men's game, but that is one area we really need to focus on. And it starts with you. Trish mentioned the great Lucy Harris. How many of you have seen Queen of Basketball, that documentary about Lucy Harris? Anybody? Please write that down and show that to your team. Lucy and Trish played against each other in high school and also played together on, the, on that first Olympic team. One of the other great impacts we had, if you have heard of Brenda Van Lingen's documentary, If Not For Them, have you guys heard about that? She's here at this convention. You really need to hear about that. She's talking about the great coaches that help, and administrators that help move this game forward. If not for them, and we say if not for us, because those young coaches came at a time when we as young players were getting those opportunities and our paths met. And that's why we have some of the coaches on this board. How many of you have heard of Margaret Wade? Wade Trophy? What about Billy Moore? Marianne Stanley? Pat Summit? Oh, come on. <laughs> Jody Conrad? Lucille Cavallos, Lynn Dunn, Van Chancellor. Okay. Huh? Time? Okay. All right, I'm sorry. Marion Washington? She's up for a fight. She's a finalist for the NASA. I rest my case. I'm going to let you go because I would talk your head off. But I rest my case. You've got to know the history. You've got to connect the dots. You cannot know how far you've come or how far the game has come. If you don't know where it started, Please follow us on our website, on our social media, Legends of the Ball, Inc. Make sure you put that ink on there. There's a lot of Legends of the Ball out there. <laughs> and please uh, go look at If Not For Them. Follow Brent Van Millions project. We're part of that project as well. Thank you so much for coming. I'm sorry we don't have time. We have to rush through this, but we appreciate your attendance. Thanks for making Locked On Women's Basketball your first listen today. Make sure to tune back in tomorrow to hear from Jackie, Alex, and M about how NIL and the COVID years affected the WNBA draft, and make sure to tune in all weekend long to hear more from Dallas. Now make your second listen, Game to Game NBA. Every moment, every top performance, every result. Locked On Game to Game covers every game from across the NBA with local analysis that only Locked On can deliver. Follow Game to Game on Locked On NBA, available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcasts.